All right, welcome to the reading of the first chapter of Even the Demons Believe. Now, I'm going to skip the Ford, and I'm going to read starting in the chapter entitled Assumption. It's kind of a really short introductory introductory chapter. Just a, it's like a just-so-you-know kind of thing. All right, so here we go. Assumption. It is assumed that the reader understands Jesus took our punishment for sins when he died on the cross. By this act of mercy, we now have the opportunity to become disciples of Jesus and live for righteousness. Christ opened for us the way to salvation and fellowship with the living God. Everything you are about to read points to entering through the narrow gate by way of the anointing sacrifice performed by Jesus on the cross. There's a scripture here. It says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. The chapter goes on to read, Praise God for his rich mercy. The way has been opened, and so let us with humble hearts discover how we too may find confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. On to chapter 1. Which way to salvation? Jeremiah 6:16 6, says this. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. Every church has their method for getting to heaven. So how can a person know the correct path? With all the different beliefs and opinions about what it means to be a Christian, no wonder so many people feel thoroughly confused. In fact, many have given up the search for God altogether because the task to discover the truth seems too overwhelming. Additionally, many today falsely think that opinion equals belief, and if we think something sincerely enough, God will accept us. To further compound the problem, Multitudes of hypocritical Christians claim they know God. All of these things and more frustrate those with an honest search for God. To find the answers, we need to follow Jeremiah's direction. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is, and then walk in it. Through these God-given words, we will find rest for our souls. In Luke 7, 48, Jesus told a woman, your sins are forgiven. God forgave every wrong thing in her actions and thoughts. Those words are the sweetest words a man or woman can ever hear. God's forgiveness should set us free and light our hearts aflame with an undying love for Him. In order to hear those words, we must first consider what it means to be a Christian. Otherwise, we place ourselves in danger of being denounced by the very God who touches our lives with love and power. As the following scripture demonstrates, Jesus disowned those whom God had touched in a powerful way because they would not repent. With this in mind, let us look at what it really means to be, to be a Christian, how one becomes a Christian, and the requirements to keep from being denounced by God. Let us see, in short, let us see the truth according to Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty says, then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. <clears throat> the chapter goes on to say, When Jesus walked on the earth, he made Christians in a very odd fashion. Jesus won souls, as we shall see, in a manner that may surprise most. This book examines how someone becomes a Christian according to Jesus. Most individuals who consider themselves Christians have responded to God's love in a way that would not receive Jesus' approval. 
As Paul stated in the book of Romans, they did not submit to God's way of salvation and instead sought to establish their own. Romans 10, chapter 3 says, Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Chapter goes on to say, Every church and denomination has their methods for saving individuals. Each has established their own way of salvation. But God declared long, but God declared long ago that only one way leads to heaven. Ephesians 4, 5 says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Chapter goes on. Each man must make a decision to either submit to God's righteousness or embrace man's religious ways. God's righteousness grows eternally, but the peace and security of man offers only empty hope. In the church today, we have established many different ways to become a Christian. People can come forward after a sermon, raise their hands, attend classes, speak in tongues, or repeat the words someone tells them to say. The salvation calls coming forward to accept Jesus vary from church to church, but which one is of God? Let us go back and look at how Jesus made someone a Christian. We will look at Jesus' salvation call, and if it does not match up to ours, let us repent and submit to God's righteousness. And after that, we have some truths to ponder, beliefs to examine, just a series of bullet point questions that just you know, get us to reflect back on, you know, the, the um, chapter and, you know, allow us to examine our own hearts in light of what we read. So I'll just read those and I'll let the viewer pick these things up between them and God. <clears throat> bullet point one. What opinions do you hold about the way of salvation? Bullet point two. Why do, you, why do you hold these opinions? Where did you learn them? Bullet point three. If you submit to God's righteousness, what might happen to those beliefs? Bullet point four. Are you ready to examine your beliefs deeper? All right. And thus concludes chapter one and the assumption in Even the Demons Believe. And stay tuned for more readings.